I went to New York this past weekend to visit a longtime friend, and my one dominant thought as the plane flew over the city was how amazingly gigantic and full of life it is. It reminded me later of an abridged quote about the city from one of my favorite books. Doesn't it worry you packing all that life together? If something should happen to all that life, how terrible. After getting settled and catching up a bit, we visited a couple bookstores. When I visit a new city, I love to visit independent bookstores, and there is no shortage in New York. I think I need to go back for a few weeks just to visit as many as possible, ideally with a lot of spending money and a couple empty suitcases. I also visited Central Park, mostly because it felt kind of mandatory, and holy crapola, it was hot. I sat, people watched, ate my two hot dogs as I slowly became more dehydrated, and when I could stand it no more, I went to the Guggenheim. I completely adore art museums, especially ones that make me think, and the Guggenheim definitely did that. I noticed this clock only peripherally when I was passing it by, but then on the other side of the museum I saw it, actually saw it, and I wanted to know more. And the wonder of the modern age is that I can know more. I can go on the Guggenheim's website and find that piece of art and learn why and how it was created and by whom, and let me tell you, the story does not disappoint. I also saw and walked through and around this maze of gently breathing blinds created by He Yu Yang, and while it is possible that the virtual experience of art can be as compelling as the physical experience in some cases, as John Green pondered in his own Thoughts from Places video several years ago, this is something you have to experience in person, particularly because different artificial scents are blown through the fans at different points, and we do not yet have smell o vision You have to be there. And in a way, I think that's compelling on its own, and I don't really think I want virtual reality to catch up to the everyday experience of being somewhere, being able to linger and be there, because if you're not, you aren't a part of anyone else's being there, which somehow seems important. I'm not sure why, but it does. I also stopped to do the expanded moment art assignment and got chastised for holding my camera over the edge, but this is some of what I got before I was interrupted. I really like the way light and shadow and reflection play together, and I think it's interesting how a lot of people from this view are just torsos and legs and feet moving along. Hurriedly or less so. I could have stood there for much longer, I think watching people, watching them react to art or pass it by, but I did not. And the next morning, my last day in New York, I left to go to Soho in Midtown. I went to a coffee shop first, where I had the best coffee I have ever had in my life, and then I went to Muji, a kind of Japanese Ikea, because I like their pens and notebooks. By the time I got to the Museum of Modern Art, I was very tired and very hungry, so the first thing I did was eat some lunch. Later, I was looking out the windows of the museum, and I took footage because I thought it was beautiful, which it is, but all I can think looking at it now is how many people get to live right next to the MoMA, and that is just not fair. It's one of the best museums I've ever been to, and houses so many famous names and famous paintings that are well worth the hype. I enjoyed it so much, in fact, that I really didn't want to leave, and ended up getting to the airport about half an hour after I should have. But, as it turns out, the southwest terminal at LaGuardia is terrible, and I'm glad I didn't have to be there any longer, though I'm glad I had this wonderful, beautiful view as the airplane taxied down the runway. I said goodbye to the city, which looks as inspiring and flawed from far away as it does up close, and I promised to come back. The benefit of having smart and talented friends is that some of them move to amazing places, and sometimes I get to visit them there. So while I said goodbye to the city and its eight and a half million people as I passed the Welcome to New York sign on the grass by the runway, I know I'll be back. Nonetheless, leaving still feels like leaving, and as the plane lifted and turned and climbed toward the clouds and passed them, I felt a little bit of melancholy mixed with the excitement of being in a flying metal box. Probably less excitement for the infants on board. And then, home. Home to rainy St. Louis, and soon to classes starting again, and cleaning my apartment, and doing laundry, and reading books, and learning new things. So, to me, 
from me. Welcome home.